So, New Year, right? Do you guys already have your New Year's resolution? No? Really? You guys kind of need to, to, to be woken up. You know, every time, you know, usually some people say that uh, December 31st tends to be a very sad day for many because they look back and they kind of look at the goals they, they, they had for that year and see how many they achieved, how many they accomplished, and probably not many, probably a few, probably none. So then we restart them the next day. We try to do that. We try to, to make new, new resolutions and start to begin the new year uh, by looking forward and figuring out what are we going to do? What is this year going to bring? And it's always an expectation, right? We're always looking forward and trying to, to see how we can seize this new year day by day and, and, and different plans and uh, different things that we want to get done. However, uh, there is a lot of value, and not, not for the sad part of it, but going back, to look back um, to 2022. Just like Dan was saying, remembering what the Lord has done what he did. And for many of us, you know, it might have been an okay year. It might have been a great year. It might have been a, it could have been better year. So many things. Nevertheless, we're all here. We made it through 2022. And we will look forward to it, but I want to invite us to look backwards. And the way we're going to do that is by remembering the Lord and going, going through a story now, through a historical event, better said, um, in Deuteronomy 8. So, open up your Bibles, um, or turn them on, and let's go to Deuteronomy 8. We're going to read the whole chapter, it's only 20 verses, and we'll see what the Lord has prepared for us. All right. Chapter 8, verse 1. The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and led you hunger and fed you with manna, which did not know, sorry, which, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. We recognize that one, right? Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your food did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, the land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills you can dig copper. And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, and his rules and his statutes which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground that, where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. 
Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he served to your fathers, as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall sh surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can, that you have given us scripture that gives testimony of you, gives testimony of what you have done for Israel, for us, for everyone. Um, I pray that as we read your word, which brings forth life, we may be challenged by it. We may be reminded that it is you, out of your grace, sheer, sheer grace, that we are here, that you have given us everything that we have. As we go into this chapter and study it and go and, and repeat its words, may they sink into our hearts, into our minds, and be encouraged to follow you, be encouraged to, to do what you have asked us to do, which is for our own good. And we may practice these things so that, that we may remember you and we may keep you Keep your word with us as we go forward. May we have an open heart to it, Father, to listen to your voice. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So, it's cut and dry chapter. We see some of the story of Israel. And we're going to go through it in more like in four, four or five parts. Um... We're going to first start with verse 1, then we're going to go to uh, verses 2 through 6, then 7 through 10, 10 through 16, and then 17 through 20. And we're going to be dissecting each portion and figuring out and, and, and just putting things into perspective and, and finding out the wisdom behind this, this chapter, behind these words. So on the first verse, be careful to follow every command I am giving to you today. So that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised an oath to your ancestors. So this is taking place just before they go into the land, right? Now this oath that the Lord promised to your ancestors, these ancestors, I think we know who they are, right? We go back all the way to Genesis 15 and the Lord told um, Abraham, I'm going to make out of your descendants a nation, but not only I'm going to uh, make a nation, I'm going to give you a land where they could live with the Lord. That was the whole point. That was the promise made. So what was the purpose of calling Abraham? If you remember, even before, humanity had really messed things up. They did not only take out of the fruit. That, that had a consequence that um, violence filled the earth, they send it a flood, the Lord sent a flood to cleanse the earth. After that, humanity still did the same thing. We find a verse in, in Genesis 9, this 8 that says that, yeah, evil is in the hearts of humanity. They're just going to continue to do what they do. And later on, we see the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. The, the Lord disperses them. And then isn't that in Genesis 12 that the Lord brings out Abraham out of that land and makes him, gives him this promise. I will make a nation out of you. I'll bring a family out of you that is going to bless everyone else and you will have land. So this is the nation that the Lord has formed already. The first time Israel is called a nation is back in Exodus 19.6. Once they have gone through um, going down to Egypt and the ten plagues and, 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 and parting the sea, the Lord calls Israel for the first time a nation. They have multiplied. They have filled the land in Egypt. That's why they were so scary for, to, to, to Pharaoh. 
they're brought out. They're taken to this place. The Lord is fulfilling his promise. Now he's going to give him the land. So what he's doing now is just to asking them to trust him. I have I've been keeping my promise. You're a nation. You're about to get the land. However, we know from the history that uh, if, we, if we read the if we read the the wandering um, narrative back in Numbers, well, they were not as faithful. They were complaining. They wanted to go back to Egypt. They were hungry. They were doing several different things, and and they had to wander for forty years. So what, what is happening? The generation that came out of Egypt, that generation is the one who wanted to go back because they were in the desert, they were hungry, they were thirsty, they wanted meat, they had nothing. They were sick of the manna. So the Lord tells them, you know, guys, you really do not want to come in. You're going to stay here. So during those 40 years, there's a new generation being brought up. And this is the new generation who's going, who's going to come into the land. So we need to make those two distinctions. There's two generations. There's the one who came out of Egypt, the one who was told, you're not coming in. And then the new generation who are being told, I'm bringing you into the land. So that's what's going on. The only ones... Out of the old generation, those coming in, who were coming is Joshua and Caleb. So they were the ones who were faithful, and, and after they went into, sp into spying the land, they said, yes, we can do this. Whereas the other ten were like, no, let's go back to Egypt, and they didn't really want the land. So we see this, that we start to see a pattern here that the Lord gives people what they want. They didn't want to go into the land. You're not coming into the land. And this is the thing. Out of God's grace, he's bringing them into the land. They haven't done anything to deserve that. It is because God has been faithful to his promise. That's what's going on. Now, in order to stay and be in the land, now they need to be faithful. Coming into the land, it's a gift. So, let's go to verses 2 through 6. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness. So let us remember these things. These 40 years. To humble and test you in order to know that what, what was in your heart. Whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, caused him to hunger, feeding you with manna. That no one knew, not even your ancestors. To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not work out, and your, field did not, your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. Remembering how the, remember what the Lord has done is equated to observing the commands. And this is a little, this, we need to make another distinction here. Let us remember, generation that came out of Egypt, staying, it's not coming into the land. It's the new generation coming in. Okay? Now, when we talk about observing commands, it is a little different how we understand in, in our culture today what to observe a law, observe a command, keep the law is. Because we think we have this bunch of laws that I have to keep, and we make it kind of like a checklist. It's like, I've kept this, I've kept this, I've kept this. I've done all these things. Whereas what they were doing here in, in, in ancient Israel is that out of one law, there's wisdom to be brought out of. For example, and Jesus brings this um, in the Sermon of the Mount. You have heard, do not kill. I haven't killed anyone. I have kept that 100%. That's okay. And that, that's how we will perceive it. But Jesus understands better what, what, what it is. It's, it's not just the command itself, what is written, just do not kill, is 
What's the wisdom behind it? Have I ever gotten angry with someone who I wanted to twist their neck or something? <laughs> That's probably too extreme. But, um, but we have had those feelings, haven't we? If we are in any kind of relationship, we have had that. Just think about your jobs. Sorry for the teachers because I think the kids are a little ruthless sometimes. But um, it, it happens. And we have all these things. So it's not just about keeping just that law, do not kill. It's going behind it. Thinking about what's the wisdom of it. There's many examples of what you shouldn't do or shouldn't kill, whatever. Um, but it's just thinking about that. What is the wisdom behind the laws? Have I gotten angry? Yes. Have I wanted to do this? Yes. That's why we need self-control. Do not commit adultery. No, I haven't. Have I lost it? No, I haven't. That's a lie. Again, is the wisdom behind it? So that's that, that's that's what we're talking about here. Observing the law does not mean just observing these little things. The Pharisees got it wrong, and they were thinking it's just about observing what the, what was written. But is the wisdom behind it? So that's what we need to think of this. So. The wisdom behind it, by that, what I mean is that we are going to extract the way of life that this implies. And we're going to live accordingly. It is not just to keep that law. It's to see how that law branches out into everything, into everything that I am, and how I need to let the Holy Spirit and let Jesus transform me. Let God transform me to live to live in that in such a way. So now, knowing that that what a commandment is, and we're going to keep going back to that just just as rem a reminder, because in our culture it just means keeping all the all, make, making the checklist of the things that we have done and we haven't done. Um, over here, when when the Lord tells you that He was He led them all the way in the wilderness these forty years. It's a good thing to see if we can see a map of this thing. Because we, they, actually the trip from Egypt all the way to the promised land didn't, wasn't necessarily 40 years. It didn't, it didn't have to take that long. The thing is that people rebel and they were not, they were not allowed to go into the land. From Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea and then the first stop is Mount Sinai. That takes like two months, give or take. There's a lot of people coming out, so it's not like you're going by yourself. So it took them two months. Now, when they got to Mount Sinai, they spent there a year. And that's when um, the Lord gives the book of Leviticus, and they gives them the, the, the blueprints for the tabernacle, and gives them all the things to spend a year there. Once he's coming back up at the mountain... They spend a year out of there. They leave Mount Sinai and took them. Uh, they take the, it takes them a month to, from Mount Sinai to. Oh, I wanted to have a map for you. I'm having some technical problems, so that's okay. So from um, Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, that's another month. Oh, there we go. Thank you. So from here to here. Okay. They spend a year in Mount Sinai. Leviticus, tabernacle, they built it, they organized themselves, and so on. After that year, they go all the way, oops, over here to Kadesh Barnea. They spend six months there. Remember the whole Balaam story? That's where they were camping. Then, they, then after this, they were supposed to go this way and go into the land. That would take them another month. Probably two. But they didn't make it. So instead of just making two months from here to here, they spent wandering over here 38 years. That's where they were. 38 years. From, it's from here that they sent the spies to look into the land. Well, actually, they go all the way here because here's Jericho. 
They didn't want to. It seems that it was impossible for them to go in because God had not parted the sea. He has not given them manna. He has not make water, uh, brought water out of the rock. He has not done all those things. So they couldn't go into the land. They decided to stay out. And then the Lord tells them, okay, you're going to spend here th the rest of, I mean, 38 years. And he tells them, even though you did not want to come into the land and you were here 38 years, the Bible just um, puts all together and says 40, he still was with them. Ma the manna didn't stop coming. We still had food to eat, but we want meat. It came too. It was quail. Their clothes did not wear. Their feet did not sew during these 40 years. So the Lord is taking care of both generations. The one who came out and the one who was coming in. The unfaithful one and the ones who were going to be proven if they're going to be faithful or not. It's out of God's grace. Mercy and grace. That's what he's doing. <coughs> now, in verse 3, he humbled you, feeding you with manna, manna, which neither you nor your ancestors have known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every wor word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. People, and as we do to the, today as well, we need to be reminded that for starters, what we eat, what we have, ultimately comes from the Lord. It's because He gives them to He gives them to us. Whether we like, whether we go to the grocery store or this one or the other, we have the means and the wealth and the power and everything to get it for to go and get it because he has provided. When that is not the case, it's because that means someone is abusing its power. But the Lord has made plenty, God has given us plenty to survive. But that's not only it. This is the this is what Jesus quotes, and he quotes it for a reason. Because we yes, we can survive physically only by eating, but we need purpose. We need goals. And the Lord, the word of the Lord gives us that. Without it, we sink into a level of existence that consists only of consuming food. We have no meaning, we have no purpose, we have no value. So we de desperately need to be reminded who we are. Who do we belong to? And that everything that we have comes from the Lord. So, and these are the little things that we look back in 2022. How we had all these things? Looking forward. Will we have all these things? Maybe, maybe not. Has the Lord been faithful in the past? Yes, he has been. And we need to start looking forward. But to look forward, we look backwards. The Lord has been faithful. He was faithful with the Israelites during those 40 years. He has been faithful with us, not only in 2022, but all the years in the past. And the question is, we will trust him to be faithful in the future. That question is to be hanging there as we continue to read um, this portion. Now, what does the new generation has to do to come into the land? They don't have to do anything. God is bringing them into it. Old generation is staying out. New generation is coming in because the Lord is bringing them in. Now, what do they have to do in order to settle and stay and live in the land? They need to observe the commandments, the statutes, the decrees, to walk in obedience to Him. And let us remember here, it is not about the checklist of keeping all these things, but is that these commandments are guiding me in guiding me to know how to live. They're guiding the Israelites, excuse me, they're guiding the Isla, Israelites in to live according to what the Lord has uh, wants them to live like. That's the whole point of these commandments. If you keep them, 
your society will be, will be one in which you guys can live here and settle here. And not only that, it's not only for yourselves, is that you can be a light to the nations, that you can be blessed, you can bless the nations around you. That is the whole point. That is what the Lord is trying to do. This is why it's so important to keep the story that it started back in Genesis. The world is a mess, and we can see how it went to, uh, went to a mess, Genesis 1 through 11. But God is having this nation be, being the means through which he's redeeming the world. How are they going to do it? To live accordingly. Doing the checklist, that does not work. It doesn't work. And we see it. Jesus had to come and fix that. Because the Pharisees thought that that was the way. Some other people do as well. But that is not the way. The commandments gives me wisdom in order to teach me, teach them how to live. In order to do this, um, we first need to read the commandment, you know, the whole process, know what it is, and start practicing it. The more we practice it, the better we, come, we become at it. If we have a tendency to lie, who convinces us not to lie? The Holy Spirit. Who has to make the effort of when in that situation I could lie or couldn't lie? We already know that we shouldn't lie. It is ourselves. We need to exercise self-control, one of the fruits of the Spirit, and then change what we're going to do. The more we do it, the more we practice it, the easier it's going to get. Let me give you an example. I have a video ready for you guys. I hope you identify this person. You're not that young. Sorry. <laughs> All right, you can push play. We can replay it if you want. He, he did shoot with his eyes closed. He didn't do that just because, you know, he was pure talent. He had talent, that's for sure. Michael Jordan, he trained twice a day during the summer, in the morning and the evening, and he would shoot at the... Basket? Yeah. The average NBA player, they do 250 in these two um, training sessions, 500 in a day. He did closer to 1,200 every day. That's over 6,000 a week, six days a week. That's how he did. That's how many he did. Mostly every day he did that. That didn't happen just because... He trained and trained and trained and trained. And that's why he was so good at it. I'm not saying we should be Michael Jordan, we should all be playing basketball. No. But when it comes to reading scripture, when it comes to the law, to the commandments and all these things and the wisdom behind it, we should practice even more intensely than he did. The more we do it, the easier it will be. It becomes second nature. We don't have to think twice in order to respond in a gracious way. We don't need to think twice in order for us to not lie or to get it out my own way. What about the Holy Spirit? We talked about, about the Holy Spirit before. And again... If we, know, if we know that reading scripture is an important thing to do, that conviction does not come out of ourselves. Do you know anyone who wakes up in the morning, or whichever part of the day they choose, and then goes to the um, Code of Hammurabi and reads it every day? 
or the Constitution? I don't think so. But who gives you the conviction? Who has given us the conviction to come and read and spend time in Scripture? If you think about it, I mean, we have a nice bonded leather or fake leather um, books, you know. But th these are uh, papyrus there's, there's crows. There, it, it shouldn't be this way. No one does that. But we are convinced by the Holy Spirit to do it. Who needs to set up the reminder and the alarm either to wake up, do not hit the snooze button, get some coffee, and read? Who needs to do it? Is the Holy Spirit going to do it for you? I don't think so. We need to do that. That's, that's when we come and we team up. Holy Spirit does the hard part, which is convincing us. We need to do the practical stuff. Verse 7. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out in the valleys and hills. A land with wheat, barley, vines, and trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey. A land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing. The rocks are iron, you can dig copper, and when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord, your God, for the good land that he has given you. He is bringing them into a land, out of his sheer grace, that looks like Eden. This land, in Deuteronomy 6.10, we read that it's a land that has with great and good cities that you did not build. Houses full of all good things that you did not fill. Cisterns that you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. It's a gift. They, have not done, they haven't done anything to deserve it. God has just given it to them. Because He's a good God. He's a good God. He's given this for them. And not only for them just to keep it to themselves, but to go and share it. To share those news that the Lord is doing something through them. To be that light to bless others. How does it look like for them? Because the, the land is given to them. That's the gift. Now what they should do is to take care of it. To make it flourish. You know, we have... Um, probably they had some apple trees or whatever trees they had. That just grows up. But it is them, or anyone, who can make it an orchard and feed many. That is making it flourish. That is using its potential for good. Let's think about another example. Let's think about farming. Now, do farmers plant and harvest corn every year? Yes? No? Every year you use corn? Do you guys alternate? The land, half and half, you do corn. On the same land that you planted corn a year, the next year, do you still plant corn? You plant other things, right? Soybeans, right? Soybeans, thank you. <laughs> um, why do you do that? Seriously, I'm asking. <laughs> why, why do you do that? <laughs> to let the land rest. Because there's something with the nitrogen... I think it is, right, going on, that you need to do that. If you just do corn every year, you're just going to deplete it out of its nitrogen. You need to put some back in. That is taking care of what we have been given. That's what it is. The question is, we have been given all the, many things. The Israelites were given this land. that They didn't plant anything. They didn't build anything. They didn't have to dig the, the cisterns or plant the vineyards. Were they hoarding what they were given? Were they taking care of it? Were they abusing it? Were they misusing it? Or were they blessing others with it? In the whole Old Testament, you don't find any moment in which they, land the, they let the land rest. They didn't do that. Hmm. Remembering the Lord means to be consistently 
and daily aware that keeping his commandments, again, the wisdom behind his commandments, brings forth life. If we don't take care, if they didn't, if they don't take care, or they didn't take care of the land, the land was not going to flourish. It was going to be depleted of everything. It seems with us. Same thing with us. So, what happens? Go we'll to the next portion. Be careful that you not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe the, His commands, His laws, decrees that I'm giving you today. And the problem with that is that when they forget, they start attributing things to themselves. We got all this. We made it happen. To fail to observe his commands and laws and decrees and the wisdom, especially the wisdom that comes behind it, is to make a habit out of them. You may lie once. That's okay. Is it though? You may think it's okay. You do it a second time. It's still okay. Nothing has happened. Then you start in this cycle. And it just dehumanizes you. It dehumanizes the Israelites. Where do we see that? There's a clear example. And ironically, it was Solomon. Wasn't he the wisest? Hmm. Deuteronomy 17, 17. Nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. He did, he made 200 shields of gold. He had that much extra gold. It's like us getting money and doing paper airplanes. <laughs> you know, or whatever it is. But Deuteronomy 17, 16. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Because the Lord told you, you shall never return that way again. What did Solomon do? He imported horses from Egypt. That's in 1 Kings 10, 28. He had like 40,000. He sent people to Egypt to get it back. Deuteronomy 7, 1, and f 7, 1 through 4. And the Lord's going to bring you into the land that you're entering to take possession of it and clear away many nations before you. The Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Parasites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. Seven nations. You shall not intermarry with them, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. David had his fair amount of marriages. Um, Deuteronomy 7, 17, he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. How many wives did Solomon had? 700. And 300 concubines. And this is the wisest of all. What, ha what happened? He forgot the Lord. He forgot to practice these things. Michael Jordan would have not been able to do that shot if he, sh he would have not practiced, if he would have not trained. Solomon was the wisest. We read all that. We he asks for wisdom. Instead of ceasing it, like Adam and Eve did, he asked the Lord, could you give me wisdom so I can lead these people? And the Lord says, yes, I'll give, wisdom. I'll give you wisdom. You ask for it, I'll give it to you. I'll give you many other things as well, wealth and, and peace and, and so on, but you ask for wisdom. During that process, something happened. And that's what we read in the, the beginning of verse, um, in verse, in verse 11, that you forget the Lord and he did not keep his commandments and he did all these things. He completely forgot who had given them all, all these things. The Bible doesn't say Solomon forgot the Lord. I think probably it does, but his practices, what he did, is evidence that he for sure was not remembering the Lord. 
their practices. And this is the king. So this is the head of the snake, right? Everyone else is following. They were so corrupt that the land itself needed cleansing from them. So this is the promise. It needed cleansing. What did the Lord have to do? Back in the flood, we know what he had to do. He just saved one. In this time, what he does is that he sends them out of the land into exile. They needed to remember the Lord, and they did not. And this is in Deuteronomy. This is always happening. When we forget the Lord, in verse 17, we start saying to ourselves, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But we are encouraged, remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirm His covenant, which He swore to your ancestors as it is today. Because if you forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, He shall surely be destroyed. And it is not that, you know, the Lord is going to come out with a stick and just start pounding us because we're not obeying. That's not the God we have, but he's going to let us go into the decisions that we have made. That's what's going on. As a matter of fact, in verse 16, you know, that uh, just going there for a bit who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you and test you to do you good in the end. That's a little bit of a clunky, I don't know, wording. It sounds a little weird. So that in the end, sorry, to humble you and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. There's, if you compare, I'm going to go into this rabbit trail, if you compare different uh, versions, you see them differently. They, they try, they're kind of like wrestling how to translate this. One way to, to, to understand this, this verse is that the Lord is humbling the Israelites. He's testing them so they can trust him that he wants to do good for them in their favor. Yes, they came out of Egypt into the desert. Are you going to trust that the Lord wants to do good for you? Or are you just going to not look in beyond what you've just seen right now? Are you going to have faith that are you coming into the promised land, even though what you see right now is just sand? Are you going to trust that the Lord wants to do you good? And the way he does good is when we trust him. The way we trust him is when we read these commands and we understand that they are just a call to live according to his will. When we do this, as we read late um, on the next verses, we forget and we start attributing things to ourselves. This is not very different from you and me. This is not very different from Adam and Eve. There is the same temptation. Am I going to trust God and his wisdom Or am I going to live according to my own? And the voice of the serpent slithers itself in. Are we going to which voice are we going to listen to? We are we all face this situation. The Israelites did, and Ananiv did, everyone does. We look back in 2022. I can't count the the many times that I've listened to this because there's too many. I do remember, I can count also, and those ones I can count, the ones that I did listen to the Lord and the blessing it came out of it. That the challenge today and for this new year is how do we keep ourselves in a position in which we listen to the Lord? How do we do that? How do we trust the Holy Spirit? You know, we don't, we don't need to go to conferences. 
We don't need to, to buy systematic theologies bo theology books. We don't need to go to retreats and so on. I mean, they're helpful. I'm not saying don't go. I'm just saying they are helpful, but they are very simple but significant things. We read. We pray. We gather together, as we are doing here today, in life groups. With other men, with other women. We do, we do that community together. And we are refreshed and we are challenged and we are reminded who do we belong to, who we are, and what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live? Yes, but the Bible is a huge book. There's several thousand pages and so many chapters and verses and blah, blah, blah. I know their plan, the, 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 the reading plans are like, Bible in a year. Yes, you can do that. Pick a book. Pick Philemon. It's how many verses? 22, 20? Pick 3 John. It's 12, I think, or less. You know, the point is not to be um, overwhelmed by the whole thing. Some, some of them are thicker than the other ones, so you can get the Gideon ones if it's going to make you feel better. Um, but we start doing something. We are convinced that here there's wisdom for us to live accordingly, to live according to, to, to the Lord's will. And that's going to make this gathering, this relationship here better with our workmates, work co-workers better, with our spouses, with our children, with our friends. It just it makes them better because, yes, we will suffer because we are sinners. And people sin against it, and we sin against other people. But we are encouraged to forgive and to restore and to start fresh. All these things, all the wisdom is here. So, yes, we look back into 2022, what the Lord has done. He has done marvelous things because we are here. We have made mistakes. But let us remember that what He has done, what He has given us, and the way to keep remembering Him today and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and for the next 364 days, we read. It doesn't have to be every day. Start once a week. There are, we have, I put some plans back there. If you guys want one, they're your version plans. There's so many plans for reading, for praying, for gathering together. And if you think of other ways of how here at, at Grace we can provide spaces for, for meeting, for studying, for reading, let us know. Talk to Pastor Scott. Talk to me. Talk to your leader. Because we want to remember, lest we forget. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Because through Scripture... Through the gathering together, we can remember you. We can remember that we belong to you. We can remember what you have done for us. We can remember your grace and love towards us. You fix or gave us a solution to our worst problem in our hearts when you took all that on yourselves, on yourself through Jesus. And we thank you for that. We need to choose to go and bend our knees towards the King and Savior and let you start the transformation in our hearts. We work together. You give us that conviction, and we need to do our part. But as we go forward and as we think about what, the, what 2022 was and look forward to 2023, May we don't forget to remember you, to look back and remember how faithful you have been. 
to remember your love towards us, to remember to ask for your wisdom so we can move forward. We don't know what it's going to, 2023 is going to bring upon us, for us, against us. But we have faith. We want to have faith that you will be with us. And that faith is strengthened by remembering what you have done. In your name we pray. Amen.